Okay, let's get into FRQs. FRQ, if you're not familiar with College Board Exam, stands for Free Response Question. That's important because there are different types of writing prompts on College Board Exams. AP exams are different, not just because of the content, but there was actually a big change in the structure of AP exams that you know if you're in other AP classes and you see your teachers shudder when they say things like the rewrite, the AP exam rewrite. So College Board decided a few years ago, starting with its core classes, to revamp their exams. There is not a plan at this point to do a rewrite for the AP Psychology exam, right? There's two reasons for that. One, the sample size is enormous for the AP Psychology exam. Unlike some of the other AP exams, it's the biggest AP exam in terms of sample size. So you get statistic you get statistically significant numbers when you have a big sample size. I think A-Push is the second highest, right? But the reason why A-Push has been redesigned and AP Psychology hasn't and probably won't anytime in the near future is because that's a core class. That's a class that you not only need to graduate from high school, but it's a class that everyone needs to take when they go to college. So if you hear the redesign or you're in a different class and they talk about LEQs or SAQs or DBQs, those are different types of writing questions than an FRQ. DBQ is obviously document-based, an LEQ is a long essay question, so in that case, the writing format matters, right? In an LEQ, you're going to have to write a thesis, and you're going to have to write an intro paragraph, and you're going to have to have transitions, and it's one long, well-thought-out explanation, one essay. Short answer questions are similar, right? They have parts, they, they kind of build off of each other, they, they're somewhat scaffolded. FRQs are not that way. FRQs have a single prompt and then multiple points, bullet points that you score by tying it into the prompt. So all of the bullet points pertain to the prompt, but they don't all pertain to each other, right? And that way, FRQs are different. So because that is the case, even the format of writing the FRQ is, is less structured, right? Um, in some ways it's probably more structured, but you can actually write bullet points in the margins. You can write A, write in bullet points, and you can write each of your answer choices as if they are separate bullet points because each of them are scored separately. It's not like an extended essay. Some people inevitably still always write big, long, flowing essays, but you're not required to do that. In fact, if you do that, you need to be really concise with what you write because you can run out of time. All right, so let's get into FRQs within the context of our exam. So our exam, we already know, has two parts, right? The first section, or section one of the AP Psych exam, it's usually on a Tuesday for us. I believe it's May 12th this year at noon. So you report to your testing site, which for us will probably be the gym because there's over 130 of you taking this test. So you report to your testing site, you check in, you get your seat and you have all the paperwork there and the test books and they're all ready to go and they walk you through the whole intro instructions and then we're now going to begin part one go so from the time that they say go in section one you have 70 minutes an hour and ten you have 70 minutes for 100 multiple choice questions that's part one that's 1.4 questions a minute which is why we do 70 questions in 50 minutes Right, not including the time it takes to pass everything out. Ours is actually a little bit shorter. So we're trying our best to simulate the test environment, even on a small scale, every time we take a test. So it's cumulative, the questions are random, they break down by percentages. You could have question number one is about chapter 10 and Freud, question number two might be about chapter two. It's completely random. So everything that we do in structuring this class is to try to give you a small, environment that's similar to the AP exam. So it's all part of that preparation. FRQs are no different. So now we'll move into the part of the school year in the second half of the year where we're going to start writing. So section two of the AP exam is 33.3% of your total AP score. So let's say a number of points that you get. So if there's 100 multiple choice questions, and there's usually about 14 points on the FRQs, so let's call it 14. That means there's 114 total points. So the scale that they create, College Board, is based off where you fall. So they're going to scale you in the first part of the question, 
or first section, I should say, first part of the test. And let's say you get 80 of the 100 questions right. That's going to determine where you fall on the scale. So that's two-thirds of your overall composite score. And then they're going to take your, how many points you get on the FRQs. So it's important for you to know it's a separate section of the exam. It's scored separately and it's scaled separately, right? So they're going to take section one, section two, then they'll get this composite score and that's going to give you a number of points. So for whatever weird, the way the algorithm works, it's usually out of 150. There's a total out of 150. I don't know how they do that math. Well, so however you end up, right, you end up with 113 points out of 150. That's going to put you somewhere on the scale. And the way the College Board works, and not all exams are the same, not all the scales are the exam, not the same, not all the pass rates are the same, right? But to have a valid test, basically, 60 to 65 percent of the students who take the test should pass it, right? Because that's a three. That's the mean. Your mean should be the highest number. Your mean, median, and mode should be close to the to the same, which would be a bell curve. And so what they do is they scale it. They don't curve it, right, in the traditional public school sense of like, you add points to the closest to 100 and that's how much you move everybody because that doesn't create a curve, right? They scale it. So they find out where's that 60% mark, that becomes the number, that becomes the pass-fail rate. So as long as you're higher than that score or at that score, then you pass. So this is a comparative score. That's important for you to hear because your mentality needs to be me versus the field not me versus the test necessarily. You go into the test knowing you're going to miss points, especially on the FRQ section. I'm gonna show you the statistics. Every single year, the mean score on each question is about half of the available points. So if there's seven questions available and the mean score is like 3.8 or 3.4 or 3.5, right? That's right around half the points. So they don't have to manipulate the numbers. We have a large enough sample size of kids taking the AP Psych exam, that the numbers kind of shake out. Social Darwinism kind of kicks in, right? But that's why they're redesigning the other exams, because they're seeing these uneven distributions of people are just preparing how to take the test like they do for the ACT and the SAT, and, and the, the really well-prepared kids get high scores and the less prepared kids get low scores, which means they don't necessarily, the test wasn't showing whether or not you knew the answers. That's the goal, right? The goal of any AP exam is to test you out of a college class. You're proving to a college admissions board that you have mastered this content and you don't need to take this class in college, right? So if you take A push and you get a four, that means that you've mastered the content because that's you compared to most of the people that took the exam. So when you go to the university of whatever, whatever, and you're supposed to take six credit hours of social sciences, well, you get credit for three credit hours. You took an AP exam, you tested out of one of those two classes. That's how College Board works. So if you fail an AP exam, meaning in the literal sense you did not pass it, it doesn't have any impact on your high school GPA, it doesn't have any impact on your score in the class, it doesn't have any bearing on your high school record whatsoever. It just determines that you didn't demonstrate mastery enough to test out of that class in college. That's what it means. So. Even just the thought process of how the scoring works is important for you to understand. So the first section that you take is a timed 70 minute multiple choice section. Once that's done, stop, pencils down. Everybody gets up, stretches, they walk outside, you get a bathroom break, you awkwardly stare at each other with your hands in your pockets for a couple minutes, and then you get to go back in and take part two. And those of you that have taken AP exams know that's pretty much how it, how it unfolds. But here's my advice to you. After taking the first section, you got a pretty good idea of how well you did. If you come out of there and you're like, oh no, this is not good. Okay, that's gonna tell you that you need to make sure that you focus, lock in, and get every possible point that you can get on the FRQ section because that could help boost your grade, right? It's only a third, but that may be the difference between a two and a three. So in 50 minutes, you can earn $1,000, right? And probably more than that because the exams, I mean, the, uh, the, the textbooks are expensive and that's only $300 a credit hour and it's a lot more than that. So think about that. If you lack the motivation to take any AP exam, even if you're not prepared, sit there and try because you can make an entire semester's worth of time, an entire semester's worth of tuition money 
in three hours. That's way more than you make at your job, right? It's way more than you make at your job. So that's the way you have to look at it is opportunity costs, right? Ironically, some people fail economics AP exams because of opportunity costs and they just blow them off, right? You're there. But that's how you can kind of understand how much work you need to do. If you feel confident, you did really well in that first section, then the pressure's off a little bit. You don't want to bomb it, obviously, but the pressure's off. You don't, you're not as stressed out that you got half the points. So they're not equal. It's two thirds and one third. That's a different distribution than other AP classes, right? In A push, it might be 50% of your grade for the first section instead of 66% of your grade. So you have to do more in the writing section than you do in the multiple choice. But even in that class, remember, it's you versus the field. It's you versus the field, not just the exam. The higher the global score average is, the higher your score has to be. So in some ways, a harder test with lower scores benefits you more, right? Because you know more than most of the people who will take this test. And that's just the confidence you have to have. So let's talk about topics and themes, and then we'll get, get, kind of get the ball rolling here. Part of the reason why I wait until January, or in this case, February, to start FRQs, well, there's multiple reasons, but one, from a practical standpoint, I like to use legitimate FRQ questions, meaning that there are questions from multiple chapters. I don't like practice FRQ questions that only come from one topic, because it's just not realistic. If we do cumulative tests, because that's what the exam looks like, we're gonna do cumulative FRQs because that's what the exam looks like, right? So the first reason is just practical. But the second reason has to do with the themes. If we're doing cumulative writing samples, then that means you have to have a pretty wide knowledge of content because they pick vocab words from a bunch of different chapters. And so it's really hard to find questions that have vocab words that you've covered you may not know them all, but I'm not going to throw a, 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 an FRQ prompt at you that has vocab that you don't know yet, right? Now, whether or not you remember it, that's on you. But if we haven't covered it in class, I'm not going to expect you to know what it means, right? So those are the ones I like to use as examples. So today when we get finished with the, the, the how-to part of it, I'm going to show you an example. And then tomorrow we'll write our first one, and it's an easy one. It's a softball question. Excuse me. It's a softball question, but you're still going to lose points. And that's fine. That's part of the critique. So it's a completion grade the first time we write it. There's no stress. There's no pressure. Try your hardest. You're going to get seven points regardless of how many points you actually score. Because that's the constructive criticism part for the next one that we write. The next one that we write, FRQ number two, that's one question also, but it counts for accuracy. Some of you will get a zero out of seven. And it will say zero in the grade book. And Karen is going to flip. Right? And she's going to say, why did you get a zero? Why didn't you do this FRQ? And you're like, uh, I did. <laughs> it's okay. Don't panic. This, the third FRQ we write is going to be 50 minutes to write two questions, and they're both going to be scored on a rubric for accuracy. And so then you're going to see a 14-point grade. Right? So we're going to progress up, and we're only going to write five of these total, including one in the fourth nine weeks before we get to the AP exam. So I'm not that concerned about the format. I just need to teach you what you're trying to do, what the goal is. We'll do that here today. And then I can let you loose and you can do it. The biggest thing about FRQs, which is why I like these out of all of them, the biggest thing about FRQs is demonstrating that you know the material. It's an exercise in recall, not recognition. Right? You know the material. Keep in mind, it's professors and AP teachers that are reading your responses. They don't know you. They don't know how awesome you are. They don't know that you're a National Honor Society scholar. They don't know that you're an AP scholar with distinction. They don't know that you're going to Duke. They don't know any of those things. They're reading your anonymous writing. So you have to be clear. You have to be concise. And you have to know they will not give you the benefit of the doubt. So you have to explain to them in a very short amount of sentences that, yes, I know what this word means, and I know how it applies to the prompt. That's all you have to do. That's all you have to do. So there's a pattern here. It's one of two categories. It's either going to be analyze a scenario. Those are the scenario questions. Or it's going to be analyze a study. So of the two questions, there's usually one from chapter two, from unit two. It's almost always the case. In fact, the one you're writing tomorrow is from unit two, from a previous AP exam. So 
I'm going to show you the trends. I'm going to show you the pattern, right? And then I'm going to show you some samples from the College Board's website, and you'll see. So each year, the AP Psych exam has two parts. We talked about that, part one and part two, and this is part two. Each question officially has a maximum of 10 possible points. They'll never go more than 10. I'll be honest with you, I've never seen a 10-point FRQ question for AP Psych. I've never seen one. That doesn't mean they don't exist, like Bigfoot. I don't know, right? I haven't gone back the duration of the entire exam. I've seen a nine-point FRQ, but even those are few and far between. And the reason why is simple. You have 50 minutes to write both of the questions. So if one question has 10 bullet points, the other one's only gonna be able to have like five or six. So they like to vary them. Usually it'll be like eight and six, or most of the time it's seven and seven. The questions are completely unique to each other. They're completely separate. One of them is gonna be a scenario, and they're gonna have made up names. It's gonna be like, Ashley's going to the grocery store. And everything that's a bullet point, that's a vocab word, you have to tie into how it would help or how it would affect Ashley going to the grocery store. So you need to always write in the context of the prompt. If they say her name is Ashley and she went to the grocery store, then you say this will affect Ashley because when she goes to the grocery store. Don't say him and her and the, the place and the people. Yes? So each bullet point is a Each bullet point is a point oh. for the question. So then you'll see when you see one. That's a good question. If it's a seven point question, the question, one question is worth seven points. Remember, there's only two questions. Then that means in that question, there's seven different topics that you have to apply to the prompt, right? And watch, it'll, it'll make sense. So each question is a maximum of 10 but they're usually gonna be around six, six to eight. The first step, and I, notice I put this in caps. Believe it or not, this needs to be stated. Do not start writing until you have read the question in its entirety. Now, you can outline. In fact, I got into the habit of doing that. I'll demonstrate that, I'll model that for you. When I read something, I'll highlight it, underline, well not highlight it, because I only have a pen on the FRQ exam, but I'll underline it or I'll circle it. I'll start making notes in the actual prompt itself. But don't start writing on the lines. Read the whole question. Read it multiple times if you have to. In fact, you all have learned from the first test compared to the retake that there are things that you miss in a question simply because you were in a hurry. So read it in its entirety, right? The wording matters. Don't imply, infer something that's not there. They're not implying. They're stating. You can't imply, you can't infer. If they state it, they state it. It's just like manifest content on a dream. If they're not saying <clears throat> a psychotherapist is analyzing the symboli symbolism of this, then it's not a he hidden deeper meaning. You, you only have what's there, in other words. You can't infer meaning. They're going to clearly state to you. And remember, don't overcomplicate this. Your goal is to show them that you know the answer. That's your goal, that's it. It's not profound. It's not a thesis. It's not a dissertation. So that's why we practice. You'll get good at this. Be concise, get to the point, but know what you're trying to say. They will not give you the benefit of the doubt. So you need to be clear. Create an outline. Now, this doesn't mean like a hierarchical take 25 minutes of the 50 to outline, but here's what I have found. And maybe it's just me. When I take time to formulate my thoughts when I get to the writing part, all I have to do is turn them into complete sentences. So I'll show you what I mean when I say create an outline. But even if you're a lazy writer like me, even if you're somebody who doesn't like to write more than I have to, that's fine. You can be a lazy writer. You can't be a lazy planner. Right? Nietzsche famously said one time, because he, 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 he very much spent a lot of time and energy thinking about the exact phrasing and verbiage that he wanted to use when he wrote. And he, he, he never really intended for anyone to read his stuff. It was an exercise for him, right? So, so Frederick Nietzsche famously stated that I can say more in one sentence than most people can say in an entire book. And he followed that up by saying, I can say more in one sentence that they can't even say in an entire book. And I think that's good advice for, for, for a writing exercise. The point is, think very clearly about what you want to say and then write it down. In other words, don't write to plan. Plan to write. Plan first, then put it down on paper. Because what you're going to do is frantically write. 
And frantic writing is not clear. It's not concise. Concise doesn't mean how, how few words can I say and still get the point. Concise is what am I trying to say and don't add anything to it. Some people write correct responses, but they never connect them to the prompt. And you'll get your FRQ back and somebody will have scored it and you'll say, Coach, I don't understand why this isn't a point. And we'll look at it and you're like, I, I effectively explained what retroactive interference is and I explained how it would affect this person. What person? And you wrote the word she. That's not her name. Her name is Ashley and you're going to roll your eyes at me and I'm going to say, no, not a point. Say Ashley. I cannot stress that enough. If they say their name, you say their name. If they say she's going to the grocery store, you write the words grocery store. This affects the people when they go to the place. What does that even mean? Clearly plan, then put it down on paper, right? So being concise means you can write less. It's not lazy though, because you've thought it out first and then you put it down. So being concise means what is it I'm trying to say? then put it down on paper. And that'll make your write, writing shorter, it'll make it cleaner, it'll make it easier to read, and then there you'll get all the points. Remember, they will not give you the benefit of the doubt. It's not their job to in, infer what it is you're trying to say. You need to tell them. And they are experts in this material. A lot of them are PhDs. So you're writing to a, a guy who looks like Sigmund Freud about Sigmund Freud. He's an old dude in his 70s with like elbow patches on his jacket and he's reading your response and it's clear, or let me say this, it's not clear that you don't know what you're talking about. They're not gonna guess. They're not gonna be, give you the benefit of the doubt. So use the verbiage from the prompt. And I say that so intensely, not because obviously I'm mad at you, because literally, not figuratively, every single year, people lose points probably in every class, simply because of this reason. They don't actually connect the vocab to the prompt. That's the number one reason why people lose points. You know what the word means, you defined it, but you didn't use the context of the question, right? So you have to write in complete sentences. This needs to be said also. You can't just write the word and underline it and put a hyphen and then write it in complete sentence as a definition. If you simply define every one of those bullet points, you will get a grand total of zero points. Even with seven correct definitions. Because this is not a matching. This is not a vocab quiz. It's how would this affect Ashley at the grocery store? And if you don't use those words and you just define the word, you're not following instructions. So there's a prompt. And there's context within the prompt, so you use vocab words to connect them to the prompt. Again, I want to stress that clearly so that there's no confusion. Use the verbiage from the prompt. Use the vocab word. Don't say this would help Ashley. Say retroactive interference would prevent Ashley from remembering the first items on her grocery list. That short sentence will get you a point with no other context. So you can be really concise as long as you state everything you're trying to say without implying it. And that's the goal. The goal is how do we write less and score more? Well, you have to think through what I'm trying to say. Go back and read it. If you were some professor who didn't know you and how awesome you are and didn't know that you get A's on every one of these tests, could they clearly see from reading your response that you know the answer? And if it's vague, add. Add something to it, right? Now, here's the good news. Once you've earned a point, you've earned it. You don't have to drone on. And in fact, you, unless you blatantly contradict yourself, you can't lose the point. So sometimes you accidentally get a point because of some way that you phrased a, a follow-up sentence, right? And you can take multiple sentences to, to get the point. For instance, you can define the word. It's not against the rules to define the word, but you, that's not enough by itself. So if you say, Retroactive interference is when old information is being interfered with by new information, right? So, in the next sentence you write, this would hinder Ashley's ability because if she went into the grocery store without her list, she would have a hard time remembering the old material or the first item she wrote down on the list. So you can make assumptions in the second question because you've stated clearly in the first question what we're talking about, right? So. 
You can take multiple sentences to get the point, in other words. Of the two free response questions, here's the pattern, right? There tends to be a pattern or trend, and it doesn't matter if it's number one or if it's number two, but usually one of those two questions is a scenario, and the other one is a research method type. One question is always related to unit two, which is research methods. And it might be a correlational study about people's views on abortion, and they did this survey of 10,000 people, and they plotted their re results on a scatter plot, and they want to create a predictive hypothesis. So the questions in that scenario would be like, how would the scatter plot, what would be the x and y axis, you know, what would be a representative sample, how do we randomly sample people, what are some confounding variables, why is correlation not causation, and that's what they all would look like. But sometimes they'll ask you about an experiment. They'll say there's a lab experiment conducted or a field experiment conducted, and we take a class of two groups, and we divide them into group A and group B. We randomly assign them to the control or the, or the uh, research group, and then we conduct our study. We plot our findings, and then all your bullet points are going to have to do with <coughs> bar graphs, control groups versus experiment groups, independent versus dependent variables, design flaws, ethical flaws, right, stuff like that. So one of the questions is going to be some type of research. And maybe it's not a correlational study or even an experiment. It might be there's two sets of identical twins and they did a case study, right? It could be one of those. But it's one of the two questions is going to be largely based on unit two. Not every bullet point necessarily, but most of them. The question you'll write tomorrow is completely based on unit two, right? And it's very basic. It's not a scenario question. It's a research method question. So those are kind of the two categories of questions. The strategy is simple. Write with the intention of getting points. It's like a grocery list. You go in there, you get your seven points, you get back in the car and you go home. Right? Just like a grocery store. If you hang around those aisles, you're going to buy a bunch of crap that you don't need. Same thing is true in your writing. If you get off on tangents, you're going to write a bunch of crap that you don't need. And it may cost you precious time. So you did this adequate dissertation on Piaget's developmental stages for the first bullet point and it goes on for three paragraphs and that took you 20 of the 25 minutes and now all of a sudden you get a one out of seven because you really got the first point and didn't have time for any of the other ones. You either get it or you don't. So get the point, move on to the next one. And you can skip them, you can write them in whatever order you want. But it needs to be clear to the reader what it is that you're connecting to the prompt. So use the vocab word. Use the verbiage from the prompt. Connect them. Help them find your points, in other words. Treat each question, again, I said that as a grocery list. Get in there, get your items, get out. All right. There are no points for format. You can very literally write A in the margin, bullet point in the margin, write complete sentences, and then move on to the next bullet point. You can skip if you want to leave some space. It's not a bad strategy, because if you find at the end of your time, you still have time left, you can go back and add stuff if you want to, right? It's not a bad strategy to leave some space. If you don't have enough space, but you have space at the bottom, you can write and then draw an arrow. The format will not prevent you from getting the points, unlike in an LEQ, right? The LEQ is about format and content. This is not. This is about content. It's almost like verbal or oral. It's almost like you're explaining to them what you know. They're not grading you on your writing. They're grading you on your knowledge, right? Take time to outline first. I'm going to share that for you. But remember, you only have 25 minutes. So read the question, sometimes multiple times. Then begin to pick apart the prompt. Notice things. Right? I'll demonstrate that for you. When you're reading through the question, notice things. That's possibly ethical. That's possibly a dependent variable. That's a design flaw. Circle stuff, right? Control group, question mark, right? Stuff like that. I always get this question, how much do I need to write? And my response is always the same. Enough to score the point, then move on with your life. If it takes you three sentences to get the point, that's fine. If you can do it in two, awesome. If you can do it in one really well thought out, concise, perfectly worded sentence, that's fine too. You can write eight to 16 sentences and get all eight points, right? Now, Keep in mind, and I can't stress this enough, because you know a lot of stuff, and you're going to prepare for the test, and you're going to go into it, and you're going to see stuff that you know, and your mind's like, oh, I know all the stuff about Freud, and you're going to write and write and write and write and write, and you just don't have time to write an essay about Freud. Freud is worth one point to you. 
That's it. So you can't get more than the one point. So once you've gotten the point, move on. They're not essays. They're, you're just explaining you know the answer. Again, top, unrelated topics, tangents, you just don't have time for those. That's where outlining helps because you know what you want to say. Here's a piece of advice they gave us. I would caution you here because if you're not careful, you can think about doing exactly the opposite of what we just said in the previous bullet point. Data dump. That means if you don't know what to say, write down what you know about that topic. So if you don't know how to connect Piaget's idea of conservation into the prompt, and you're horrified, just start talking about Piaget. Because for two reasons. A, you might accidentally score the point. You just might. You might write something that phrases well enough to get the point. But the second reason, and this one's a little more practical, as you write what you know about Piaget's theory, it might spark a thought process in your brain, and then you're like, oh, now I know. So sometimes you're writing just for creativity. But again, I'm going to caution you. That's if you literally don't know what the word means. Write down everything you know about it until you come up with an idea. Eventually, you just cut your losses and move on, right? Maybe save that one for the end. That's if you don't know what that word means. Data dump. Just write down everything you know about it, and maybe you'll get the point. Don't make something up. Just write down what you know, right? If you see a vocab word, which is most of the time in a scenario question, right? Not so much the research question, but the scenario questions have vocab. How does this apply to whatever? The example I keep using is, how does this apply to Ashley going to the grocery store? If you see a vocab word, it's not a bad idea to define it. You don't have to define it. And I can't stress this enough. Definitions alone will not score. If you do nothing other than define the words, even correctly, you will get zero points. It doesn't matter that you can define the word. It matters that you can connect the word within context of the prompt. So it helps to define the word, but it's not required to define the word. In fact, you don't have to define the word at all. You can start with retroactive interference, would prevent Ashley from dot, 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 and get it, and get the point. But I like the two sentence setup. I like the retroactive interference means blah, 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 period. And then the next sentence, this would hinder Ashley from going to the grocery store because, period. So define the word connected to the prompt. Define the word connected to the prompt. Define the word connected to the prompt. If you don't know the definition, don't worry about it. Because here's the good news. Even if you write the wrong definition, but correctly connected to the prompt, you will still get the point. Because they don't care about the definition. They care about the context within the writing prompt, right? So make sure you connect it back to the scenario. Again, definitions alone will not score. It says so in the rubric. It's perfectly fine to structure your paper as the question is laid out. Help the reader find your points. If you're writing part A, put part A in the margin. If you're writing three bullet points for part A, put A and then do bullet points in the margin. The big thing though, and you have to write this somewhere, you must write in complete sentences, grammatically correct sentences. You can't write a bullet and write, is when people go to the blah, blah, blah. You can't write that. You can't write that. You can't write retroactive interferences when blah, blah, blah. And that's a complete sentence, but it doesn't connect to the prompt. So you have to use complete, grammatically correct sentences in order to get the point. If you don't write in complete sentences, it won't score, even if you're correct. Because again, they can't infer your meaning. You have to clearly state your meaning. That's why the mean score is half. It's not because, on average, people know half of the vocab words. It's because people don't adequately connect their definitions to the prompt. Do not include intros or transitions. You just don't have time to do that. It's not an LEQ. It's not a flowing essay. Now, st strategically, specifically for the context of psychology, I'm going to give you some terms and some buzzwords that they use a lot. Just things that you need to recognize when you see them, right? You're familiar with the biopsychosocial approach to things. So that comes up a lot, whether it's, even if it's not biopsychosocial. The buzzwords that they use come up a lot. So for instance, if they're saying, if they use the phrase social, cultural, learned, parenting, peers, schooling, interactions, environmental, those are all keywords or buzzwords for something that is nurtured into you. You were not born with that. 
right? So a research scientist is studying the behavioral patterns of teenagers on a high school campus, and they want to know how their peer interactions influence their political views. Well, peer interactions are social. Social is nurture. You weren't born a Republican. You weren't born a Democrat. You were nurtured into it, right? So that's just a buzzword to know. Those are just fancy words for nurture. The nature words, anything that's biology, chemistry, heredability, heredity, innate, inborn, right? Neurological, well even neurological is not necessarily nature because it can be triggered by nurture, right? So pathways in the brain, evolutionary things in the brain, you know, we could go on and on, you know, when you see, you know, survival and reproduction, you know, it's going to be evolutionary psychology or Darwinism, right? They talk about pathways in the brain, it's something that's biological, it's usually nature, it's not always nature. Right? They're talking about blood chemistry. They're not talking necessarily about peer influences. Here's a term that gets misused a lot. Okay, and actually it's probably an, an incomplete definition. Confederates refer to people who are helping with the study. Not all of the participants in the study. So that's kind of a vague explanation. Right? I should probably add some terminology to that. So don't say Confederate when you mean participant. The easiest way to not screw up is just write the word participant. Write the word participant, right? A confederate would be somebody who is part of the, con the, the study. They've been planted, right, in the study. So say a Philip Zimbardo ha had a plant, you know, somebody who was in the study, but they were secretly part of the study, and no, none of the other participants knew it. That would be a confederate. Or maybe it's somebody who's helping to actually administer the drugs in the setting of the lab, like you don't know which one is the placebo and which one's the actual pill. That's a confederate. So a confederate is somebody who actively assists in the carrying out of the study. A participant is somebody who's being tested, right? Somebody who's getting the experimental treatment. So, so it's perfectly fine to use the word participant. Don't say researcher when you mean participant. When you say researchers were given a pill. No, they were not. Participants were given a pill. Researchers are the ones conducting the study, right? So that's a big difference, the difference between participants and the researchers, right? Because if researchers are giving electric shocks to participants, okay. If participants are giving electric shocks to researchers, it's like a mutiny, right? Like something bad, like the, the, pris the prisoners have taken over the prison. Participants are people who are engaged in the study. Confederates are people who are assisting with the study in some capacity. Researchers are the ones who are conducting the study, right? Correlations do not equal ca uh, causations. At some point, you're going to get the opportunity to write that, and you're going to get the point simply for stating it. And this has to do with scatterplot studies, okay? Correlational studies that I like to refer to as scatterplot studies. The purpose of a correlational study is the next best thing to an experiment. Experiment is ideal because we can eliminate confounding variables. We can find cause and effect. We can't always do that though, right? If we want to see the impact of you know, childhood abuse on future success, we can't abuse children on purpose in order to eliminate confounding variables. But we still want to know the answer. So the next best thing is a correlational study or a case study. And the difference in a case study is a smaller sample size because it's a unique thing, right? So a correlational study might be something more broad than childhood abuse. It might be something like people's political views, right? Do their political views correlate to their socioeconomic status? Well, we can find that out. All we gotta do is plot the data, right? So correlational studies will predict outcomes, but they don't necessarily prove that one variable causes the other variable. That's why we technically don't have independent and dependent variables in the truest sense of the word. We have an X and Y value, right? Does money cause happiness? Does happiness cause money? No, probably not. But does money predict happiness? You bet it. You bet it does, right? Uh, so it's a predictive thing. Correlations do not equal causations. We have to account for outside confounding variables. Why? Do people have more paper in the bank happier? Well, because they have a higher quality of life. They have better health care. They don't have to worry about food. You can eliminate stressors that people who have financial problems go through, right? There are other contributing reasons why, but they're still
predictable factors, right? Okay, let's get into um, a sample here, okay? When we go to the College Board site, I'm going to read you question number one from the 2016 exam. Am I? Yes, I am. Am I? What number is that? Number one. Yes, I am. Okay. So this is from the 2016 exam. This is an exam that, that, that my students, pr previous students, had taken. Um, and I can show you the breakdown of the numbers of this, right? So I'm going to read the question to you. I'm going to show you the breakdown of the numbers. And then I'm going to show you how I write this. So this is what we refer to as a scenario question. These are a little bit harder than the research questions, right? So I'm going to show you how I would outline this, and I'm going to show you how I would write it. I actually wrote it down on notebook paper so that you could see it. So notice it has a part A and a part B, and notice it has bullet points. So if we're going to structure our question that way, we would put part A in the margin, we would put the bullet points in the margin, and we would answer them. I answered them in the order just because I knew all the answers. If you don't know all the answers, you can put the ones you don't know off till the end and get as many points as you can, and if you still have time. Right? So let me read it to you. This is question number one from the actual 2016 exam. No, sorry, question number two. In a geography course, Danny is required to learn the capital cities of every country of the world. At the end of the semester, the professor will randomly select 20 countries and give each student an oral quiz on the capital cities in front of the class. Part A, explain how each of these vocab words will help Danny with success on his quiz. Definitions alone will not score. Part B, explain how each of the following will hinder Danny's ability on the quiz. Definitions alone will not score. So when I look at this, here are the vocab words for part A. So what we have to do is use these words in context of how they will help Danny on a vocab or on a capitals quiz. Distributed practice, a mnemonic device, a secondary reinforcer, as opposed to a primary one, and the big five trait of conscientiousness. So not only did they say big five traits, they went all the way into one of the, the traits. Part B, explain how each of the following might hinder Danny's ability on the quiz. Retroactive interference, self-fulfilling prophecy, and his sympathetic nervous system. And you're like, wow, those are random. And yes, they are. So let's go through it. So as I'm reading this, by the way, this is the exact format and font that you see on your answer key when you get your little booklet. They provide you with the answer booklets to write, and as you flip the pages over, the prompt is there again. So you don't have to keep flipping back and forth. So as I'm writing, I'm underlining anything that you see in the verbiage is something I wrote down before I even get finished reading. This is just my process, okay? So, no, I showed you a totally different one. My bad about Danny. <laughs> I'll show you the one. I think I wrote the one for Danny. I'll show you that in a second. Okay, here we go. Let's move on. Here we go. Let me read you a different prompt, and we'll go back and look at Danny. My bad. Okay, because this one's already queued up. It says, researchers investigated whether a good luck-related superstition would improve the performance of participants attempting to hit a golf ball into a hole. And they're citing, apparently that was a real study in 2010. Participants in the study were randomly assigned to one of two groups. The first group were told, here's your ball. So far, it has turned out to be a lucky ball. Those in the second group were told, this is the ball everyone has used so far. So they're trying to add a superstitious element to it. Participants then made 10 attempts to hit the ball into the hole. The researchers measured the number of successful attempts, which means that's the dependent variable. And they found the mean difference between the two groups was statistically significant. They didn't even tell you the percentage. It doesn't matter. The researchers theorized that superstitious beliefs produce higher levels of self-efficacy, which led to an improved performance. So that's your theory or your hy hypothesis. So part A, three points, identify the design feature that makes it experimental rather than correlational. So all you have to point out is why is this an experiment? Part B, or I'm sorry, second bullet point, explain what it means to say there is a statistically significant difference between the two groups. And then bullet point number three for part A, explain how a superstitious belief might be related to a higher level of self-efficacy. There, that's better. Stop. 
And then part B, many people, completely separate sentence, engage in superstitious behavior, such as wearing lucky socks, in, in the belief that the superstitious behavior will be, lead to improved performance. Explain how each of the following may lead to the development or the maintenance of a superstitious behavior or belief. The first one is illusory correlation. The second one is positive reinforcement. The third bullet point is external locus of control and an episodic memory. So here's how I plan. Just so you can see, before I get to the sentence phase, this is what I did. Part A, random assignment. That's what makes it an experiment. We randomly assigned them into two groups and tested them under the same conditions. It's, a, it's an experiment. Why is this statistically significant? Literally means it's defined as the, the, the percentage is too high to be coincidental. This one took a little bit more writing. Personal belief replaces doubt when believing outside forces are at work. You don't have to write that. In other words, a golfer knows they will sink the putt since the ball is lucky. So they believe it's lucky, therefore they will have a higher level of self-efficacy. They will, they will, it's basically a positive self-fulfilling prophecy, right? And then how to, engaging in superstitious, illusory correlation, it's kind of like Skinner. What were you doing when you had the positive outcome? You correlate it to the behavior. Positive reinforcement, having a success reinforces the superstition. You wear your lucky socks, you hit a home run, it reinforces the superstition because it worked, right? External locus of control means that you believe in outside forces at play here. I believe this ball is lucky, therefore I trust the luck. External, it's not my skill in sinking the putt, it's the luck of the ball. And then finally, an episodic memory is just an event that happened in your life. You remember a previous time where you wore your lucky sock, or you hit a lucky ball and you had success, right? So if we go down and now just turn those into sentences. Literally, write A, put a bullet point. Experiments differ from correlational studies in that experimental design means participants are randomly assigned to either an experimental group or a control group. In a correlational study, that's scored, by the way, according to the rubric. I didn't read the rubric until afterwards, so I wrote two sentences. In a correlational study, two statistical variables are being plotted on a scatter plot to show relationships as correlations. The 2010 design by Damish, uh, Stroberak, and Musweiler, to t and I did that just because I didn't know how much I was going to have to state, so I connected it to the prompt. To test the effects of superstition on performance is experimental because participants were randomly assigned into either a control group or the experimental group. So. This second sentence wouldn't have gotten me the point by itself, but this one did and that one did. So you don't get more than one point, but I scored the point two different times, right, by writing three sentences. And the reason why I did that, I wasn't confident in my answer, so I just kept going. This one was a little bit quicker. A statistical significance between two groups in a research study is the statistical conclusion that the resulting findings of dependent variable are not likely the result of chance or coincidence. That's enough to get the point. And I even went on, but rather likely result from manipulation of the independent variable. That's all you have to say. Because they ask why. What does it mean to be statistically significant? Again, superstitious beliefs can lead to participants to have a higher level of self-efficacy because when they believe they will have superstitious advantages, such as good luck, their resulting performance is improved. The added confidence in the outcome can have an enhancing effect on their performance. So two sentences, one point. And I'll just show you one more. Let's skip down to how it would hinder our external locus of control. Here we go. Just another example. External locus of control is the belief that circumstances or situations are dictated by outside forces. Define, connect to the prompt, right? Define and connect to the prompt. I'll show you, because we'll have time tomorrow, I'll show you the Danny, I'll show you the Danny example with the geography.